A few weeks ago, I published an article on my blog that really stimulated a lot of debate. That article is called The Real Reason Conservatives Always Win, and in it, I took the argument put forth in this book, The Social Conquest of Earth by Edward Wilson. I took his basic argument, which is that groups that have greater cohesion tend to win over groups that have less cohesion, and I applied that argument to U.S. politics, making the claim that conservatives in the United States have much deeper social cohesion and have invested in infrastructure that allows them to work in a coordinated fashion, whereas progressives tend to be divided into issue silos and don't have the investments in infrastructure, especially media and organizing skill uh, capabilities. And so progressives tend to lose. And I want to explore that a little bit further today as we look to the future and think about the upcoming a presidential election in the United States, as well as more broadly, the challenges that we face in addressing global problems such as climate change and resource depletion, where this question of group cohesion is really fundamental uh, in asking ourselves, will humanity be able to come together on a global scale and deal with our problems? And so the basic argument that Wilson laid out in this book is that um, the social organization of animals that have social behavior, such as ants and termites, bees, and of course humans, um, enables those species that are able to form stronger social organization to be able to outcompete those uh, individual species that cannot form such strong group cohesion. And there's plenty of uh, evidence for why this might be the case. But in the context of U.S. politics, and I think more broadly in the global approach to dealing with things like climate, um, we have to ask this question of what does it take to create group cohesion? How does group cohesion work? And how can we learn from what we're now getting a sense of from science about group cohesion to be able to tackle these problems? And Wilson does a nice job of laying out why it's so important for us to be asking this question, but he doesn't give the complete answer on his own. And so I picked up another book, this one here, Moral Origins, The Evolution of Virtue, Altruism, and Shame, by the anthropologist Christopher Bohm, and started reading it because Bohm asks a very fundamental question. He asks, how is it that social morality arises in the particular kinds of groups that are in human ancestry, specifically the long period of time where we lived in hunter-gatherer societies. And his argument is that the fundamental uh, selection pressure for groups over individuals arose in the context of hunting for big game and the need for small groups of people in their tribes to be able to punish bullies or dictators, people who would cheat and game the, uh, the hunting system to be able to get advantage for themselves to the detriment of the group. And so his suggestion was that the, um, the rise of the social behavior of altruism can be linked with the punishment or the punitive aspects of shame and that those who would try to take more for themselves would be shamed by their group. And of course, everyone in the group knew each other, so the shaming could be very effective. And an ultimate form of shaming would be to ostracize or kick that cheater out of the group, which would lead to a almost certain death in those times, because survival outside of the group was so precarious. So as we think about last year with the rise of the Occupy movement, and we ask ourselves, how is it that global civilization is dealing with the cheaters or those who game the global economy for individual gain over the collective well-being? That same fundamental question that hunter-gatherer societies have been grappling with all the way back to antiquity and the rise of social organization in our species, that's been a fundamental thread. And so Christopher Bohm has been trying to answer that question. One of the things that he suggests is that the way that we understand how social behavior is reinforced is to first look at how antisocial behavior is punished. And now that's not the end of the story, but it's a very important beginning piece. And I think we should hold on to that as we ask this question of how do we develop frameworks for cooperation 
especially at a scale larger than individual cultures, such as the global scale, to deal with big problems. And that uh, questions like what Christopher Bohm is, grap is grappling with are going to be very, very important. Now, we actually have some research, historic research, in modern times that takes us out of that hunter-gatherer context and helps us begin to answer this question of how does cooperation work in the complexities of modern society. And this book here by Robert Paxton, The Anatomy of Fascism, is actually a really helpful, helpful kind of a teachable moment for thinking about how cooperation can lead us astray. So what Paxton uh, asked himself was, he basically asked, how is it that a group of people can use a democratic process to establish a dictatorship? which is somewhat the opposite of what Christopher Bohm was saying about hunter-gatherer societies, where the egalitarian ethos and the social morality of sharing that's so essential for tribal communities to survive could actually be subverted through a tribal identity that enables a group of elites to evoke that tribal identity and then place a dictator at the helm of the civilization, which is what happened with Mussolini in Italy, post-World War I. It's what happened in um, the Third Reich in Germany, post-World War I and entering into World War II. And we can see threads of it today in the, uh, the eliminationist and hate-based rhetoric of the Tea Party of the John Birch Society here in the United States, where these groups that have very strong tribal identity. And of course, this is more broadly an issue um, with uh, with fundamentalist groups, fundamentalist religious groups around the world. So this question of how do we do with terrorism, how do we um, keep strong social cohesion of those groups that seek to dominate other groups through an authoritarian mindset, how do we handle them? Well, one of the ways we begin to answer that is to look at what we know about fascism. And of course, fascism is an unusual mix of shared social identity a strong belief in an inherent superiority of one group over another, and the cohesion of that group to be able to rise and dominate, often ironically through the democratic process, to get a majority of people to vote for an elite group to dominate society. And so there are some perversities there that we need to grapple with. But really, the question that I see that we need to answer is, how do we take these kinds of questions you know, the, the nature of group cohesion, how it allows one group to outcompete another, and how sometimes group cohesion can enable bullies to dominate and set up dictatorships. Uh, when we ask the questions of how does all that work, one of the fundamental questions that comes to mind is how does a group of people evoke a cultural meme, which means a, a way of thinking about the world that becomes provocative and that spreads across different communities of people, to enable either cooperation that is beneficial to the group or cooperation that leads to subjugation of the group. And what we found historically is that the only way that human beings could form greater strength than individuals was to form organizations. And until recently, the only way that we could form organizations was through a kind of centralized, top-down, command and control, you could almost think of it as the industrial model of manufacturing, applied to division of labor. So you would have an executive who would lead an organization that would then set an agenda and would create a kind of subjugation for the workers. And this is what we call, um, you know, today we think about people who work a job to get a wage because they can't survive and provide for their own without having a job that pays for their salary. That's a kind of um, coercion where they are coerced by a need for money to work within a system that subjugates them to that system. And then there's a centralized management structure that enables the owner of that organization, which may be the investors in the corporation, uh, and uh, that they are then able to have undue influence and power over the workers and create a system with strong social cohesion that actually creates a kind of centralized control. Now, recently, there have been a number of breakthroughs in the way that we organize society, in the way that we organize people to get things done, that has broken out of this mold 
and it's been driven by the digital communications and software computing uh, technology revolutions of the last 40 to 50 years. And so um, we see that if we look at phenomena like the open source software movement, and this book here, The Success of Open Source by Stephen Weber, lays out in very clear detail how it is that the economics and the politics of group collaboration can happen without there being any centralized command and control system. And so uh, the basic question is, how can a group of people with a shared affinity and a shared agenda organize themselves without a centralized authority? And that has now been demonstrated through projects like the formation of the Linux operating system, the creation of Wikipedia as an open source platform for building and sharing knowledge. And those basic questions are being answered. One of the critical ones is, what is the cost of the economic transaction for like-minded people to find each other and distribute their labor? And with online tools, email, um, discussion forums, blogs, Twitter and Facebook, all of these social media and group organizing tools enable people to aggregate themselves at a very low cost of time and effort to be able to work on very large projects without there needing to be a centralized control, which means for the first time ever, we can replace a kind of fascist, top-down, centralized management system with a much more open, collaborative, transparent, distributed leadership system. And there's been plenty of writing about how this works, and I'll give two examples. One is from Clay Shirky. He's written several books, but this one really lays out the core ideas. Here comes everybody. And the subtitle is, Revolution Doesn't Happen When Society Adopts New Technology. It happens when society adopts new behaviors. And so this book is about the power of organizing without organizations. And Clay Shirky explains in clear detail that supports Stephen Weber's work that we now have the technology and the cultural knowledge of practices and leadership models for governance and decision making that enable us to organize ourselves without centralized authorities. Now, another um, set of work that helps support this is this, um, Crowdsourcing, Why the Power of the Crowd is Driving the Future of Business by Jeff Howe. You've probably heard of crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing is the set of techniques and technologies and cultural norms and practices that enable groups of people to organize themselves into collectives to get things done. And so it's a way of creating innovation through collective action which means we're actually tackling this problem of how does cooperation work without dictatorships in a practical way by building tools and creating communities of practice that actually do it. And they're demonstrating it through the success of their efforts. And this is leading to a lot of interesting things, such as, uh, as this book describes, uh, the rise of collaborative consumption. Collaborative consumption being a new model of group effort that is based on a different way of thinking about property and ownership. So one of the big uh, challenges for breaking out of the model of capitalism we've had in the last three centuries is that the typical way of thinking about economic productivity is that those who can control and exclude others from using resources, whether that's land, whether it's access to minerals, whether it's access to ideas and information, that those people are able to then invest effort and through paying money for creating organizations and hiring people to do work to create value and then monetary return off of the ownership of those commodities. And what we're finding is that we can now flip that on its head and distribute ownership and create shared value across a community of people who find common value in the access to that thing, and that thing might be shared access to cars, like the way that Zipcar or car sharing programs work, where you don't have to exclude others from having the car to be able to get value from it, and the shared access is what creates value. It could be land management practices, like what the Land Conservancy does, where access to productive land is something that creates value for everyone, especially when we're talking about the land creating value like floodplains that protect from damage to cities or farmland, or water management, where the need to have a sustainable um, management practice so we don't run out of water is to the benefit of everyone. And so a collaborative model of ownership. 
enables everyone to put a stake in and for people to monitor each other to be sure the resource isn't exploited in a way that hurts the long-term viability of the community. And there have been some models of how this works that actually go much more into a sophisticated discussion of how economies work. And I'll just give two examples. Um, one is this one, Regional Advantage, by Annalise Saxen uh, Saxenian. Uh, and this book explores the difference in the innovation ecosystem between the, uh, the corridor of businesses around Boston versus the uh, corridor of businesses in Silicon Valley in the Bay Area in California. And what is really interesting about the research that Annalie does, or what she did in this, is she explored how the culture of collaboration, of open sharing of ideas, of people moving from one company to another, where they share an affinity for innovation rather than a loyalty to a specific tribe, which would be their company, and having a larger affinity to the tribe of the innovation scene in Silicon Valley, how that enabled the group to innovate more quickly, to distribute ideas, to build on each other's success, and to create really robust regional economies that are able to outcompete other economies, which is why the term regional advantage is described here. That Silicon Valley has been able to outcompete other technology spaces by having this collaborative framework of open sharing while also having built into it a set of practices around business and innovation and profit sharing, as well as investing to make money. And so it's kind of a hybrid of different models. Now, of course, all of that works because there's a deeper collaboration happening, which is that in the United States throughout the last 70 years, we have pooled our taxpayer money to invest in a public education system, um, to create national research laboratories, to build um, research universities. We have this vast infrastructure of basic science and basic education that has enabled this layer of competition to happen on top of that fundamental infrastructure of collaboration. And a great book that explores how that works is this one, Closing the Innovation Gap by Judy Astrin. And what Judy does is she lays out how that innovation infrastructure, funded through a deep level of collaboration at the community level, has enabled the competitive uh, activities of our economy to be innovation drivers because they build on a foundation of deep investments and long-term collaboration. And so competition and collaboration are not at odds with each other, but they actually work in a fortuitous loop at different levels. And so if we fail to invest in shared infrastructure, then we lose the ability to compete with each other internally at the industri industrial level, but also externally to compete with other economies. And so it's not whether we compete or collaborate, but how we do both in a model that's hybrid, built on the strengths of each one. And ultimately, this whole set of ideas about how does collaboration work, what's the nature of competition, what does our underlying evolutionary biology tell us about how groups, how human groups have done this throughout antiquity, it all builds up to, I think, a very important question, which is how does the change in human culture impact our ability to activate our competitive or our cooperative drives? Because they're both part of human nature. And that leads to a really provocative question. That question being that uh, how does human civilization move from being profoundly selfish, short-term in its thinking, competitive and exploitative, which is destroying the global environment and calling into question the viability of human civilization? How do we get from that mode of human behavior to a different one where we have global scale collaboration to protect the infrastructure and the ecosystems that we depend upon for our survival so that instead of being a destructive force on the planet that we become a restorative force or something akin to being stewards of the uh, the economic productivity if you will of the global economy and, and I actually have three books here that make the case that that is both possible and in some ways that we're actively moving toward it. And one of them is this book here, uh, Here on Earth, A Natural History of the Planet by Tim Flannery. Tim Flannery uh, has studied the history of planetary 
evolution. So how did the planet form? How did plate tectonics change the landforms? How did different kinds of plants and animals evolve on those landforms? And he takes that deep historic geologic perspective, and then he asks questions about how it is that humanity arose in the particular historical, climatic, and geologic contexts that we arose in, and how is it that the the global patterns, the planetary patterns of living systems, creating a range of uh, of temperature, of uh, ocean acidity, of um, amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, all these key measures that are within a very delicate range that allows life to survive on the planet, how actually living systems have enabled that. One example being that the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere today is much, much lower than it was for the first billion years of the planet's history. And also the amount of oxygen is much, much higher. And we know that the only thing that could create that influx of oxygen and that reduction of carbon in the atmosphere is life itself, in particular photosynthesis. Photosynthesis being the process that pulls carbon out of the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide, stores it in the body of carbon-based beings, and then um, in the process consuming oxygen but also releasing carbon monoxide, which is then better able to elevate the amount of oxygen and reduce the amount of carbon dioxide. So throughout history, living systems have enabled the planet to maintain an, op an operating range that's conducive to life. For those of you who are uh, astute uh, observers, you'll know that this is called the Gaia theory, and it was introduced by James Lovelock. The idea that living systems themselves have enabled the planet to evolve dynamically to a place that's conducive to life. And if we take that idea very seriously and ask, how can humanity become something more like the life support system or the immune system of the planet, then we're really talking about how does human culture evolve in a way that we have a profound cooperation with the planet's ecosystems. And there are two other books that I want to share that make the case that we're actually going through that cultural evolution process now. One of them is this one right here. The Cultural Creatives by Paul Ray. And The Cultural Creatives is a, uh, a large sociological study. So it's surveys, um, focus group studies, interviews, questionnaires what, that have asked more than 100,000 people about their values and their preferences over the last few decades. And what uh, Paul Ray has shown in this work is that there's actually a trend toward more ecological thinking, a uh, deeper relationship with the environment, a uh, move from materialistic and hedonistic values more toward community values and quality of life values, and that we can actually see that markedly as an intergenerational pattern. So we are moving toward the kinds of cultural expression that would enable us as a global civilization to make this transition to being the life support system for the planet. And I think even more powerfully, uh, the argument is made in this book, The Empathic Civilization by Jeremy Rifkin. And what Rifkin shows is that there is a general trend that as any society becomes more complex, it has a greater division of labor, which means there are more clarified roles for how people can actively participate in that society, and that the ability to understand those different roles is an expression of an increase in empathy. The ability to see from different perspectives, see their value, look across them and see how they're part of building the complexity of that society. And that as we look across time, there's a historic trend that as any civilization becomes more complex, it also becomes more empathetic. And that the question of whether we become a global sustainable civilization could really be asked as, uh, can human cultural evolution evolve the capacity for embedding empathy in the infrastructure of our society faster than our tendency to be greedy, selfish, and short-term in our thinking, which is going to lead to the destruction of our civilization? And so that question is now before us. And luckily, we have all of these resources to use to help us answer that question. And what I would like to suggest, based on the research I've been doing and reading these books and talking to researchers who study these things, is that I want to suggest that we now have a scientifically rigorous set of knowledge and methodologies that come from different fields, 
anthropology, neuroscience, psychology, linguistics, history, um, evolutionary biology, and, and even more. And in these different fields, we're actually seeing a converging picture of human nature that reveals our true complexity, that shows us that this choice of which part of human nature to elevate is something that is a real and empirically valid choice. And we can actually look at our success or failure. Where have we created fascism? Where have free riders, bullies, and cheaters been able to game systems for their benefit? What kind of governing systems enable us to regulate against those societal harms? The answer that we're finding is that there's a mix of um, socialism in the sense of investing in infrastructure for societal well-being. That means public education. That means universal health care. That means um, investing in science and medicine and hospitals and public health. Investing in the infrastructure for business through courts and through um, trade associations, through stock markets, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all this societal infrastructure. And at the same time, building governing systems that are democratic, which means they elevate the power of individuals to make empowered choices and to seek fulfillment. But the democracy has to be a modern democracy, meaning that it has to be pluralistic because societies are obviously pluralistic when you look at the different kinds of cultures that are out there. And so we need to have parliamentary, multi-party systems that enable each group in society to be able to have a clarified, articulated voice for its tribe, while also being able to defer its conflicts to a higher level that has neutrality and that can actually promote real justice in society, which means that those groups can form their own parties in their governing system and that they can have proportional representation and that they can actually form coalitions with like-minded people in other tribes, meaning other political parties, in order to maintain the stability of their society while also having negotiations, compromise, and dis disagreement that doesn't devolve into polarization and division. Of course, in the United States, we can see that we have a two-party system that proposes that that promotes in a dynamic way it promotes that you're either part of one camp or another, or you have no voice. Which means that over time, it polarizes and divides us, and anyone who doesn't agree with those two perspectives is basically left out. Which is one of the reasons why so few people vote in the United States. We have, you know, 40% of the voting public is who shows up to elections. The other 60% don't feel like the system, the governing system we have, represents their voice. And we can also see that this two-party system has enabled a corporate elite to establish a kind of economic dictatorship. And the conflict between all of those groups who aren't able to find real and meaningful negotiation, while at the same time uh, keeping in check the bullies, we end up with things like Occupy Wall Street, which is an expression of frustration by a society of people in the U.S., and actually globally, because this is the case in many countries, where we do not have uh, governing and economic systems that promote social welfare, investments in societal infrastructure, and empowered pluralistic democracy. So anywhere we don't have that, we need to create it. And that's true at the local community level, at the national uh, societal level, and also at the global level through the way that we form trade agreements, international courts, uh, and um, ultimately um, ways of managing the global commons on a scale that's larger than nations. So at all those levels, we have to build on these insights about human nature if we're going to succeed. So I hope that this is helpful and useful to you because I've been studying these things to enable me to be able to grapple these questions and help groups that are trying to build robust pathways to global sustainability and social justice. But I also hope it's, that it's useful to you in your work. So um, if you have any questions, please feel free to just write to me. Uh, I blog at cognitivepolicyworks.com, as well as my personal blog, chaoticripple.com. And, uh, and I'm constantly researching these things and talking with people about them, finding like-minded people who are studying them and trying to aggregate the insights that they bring together. So maybe you have some insights, some pieces of the puzzle that I don't have, or maybe you want to learn more about what's already here.
Either way, I hope this is useful to you, and I wish you the best of luck in doing your part to be empowered to create positive social change to lead us toward a global configuration of cooperation and sustainability. Thank you.